Amen. We're starting, uh, it's really not a new series, but uh, because when you talk about the seed of the Word of God, that covers the whole, the whole Bible. Amen. Uh, but we're starting a new series um, called the Love Series. Amen. So I just got a message that I'm on live. Amen. That's awesome. If you have your phone, invite somebody. Amen. Uh, to watch. Um, the title of today's message is, When I Was a Child. When I Was a Child. And so I'm, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit this morning about what it means to mature in the Lord. Yeah, kind of response I thought I would get. Oh, look at this. At least serious responding. Man. So, um, where, do we, where do I get that from when I was a child? We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Paul is saying, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. That's awesome, right? I'm going to read that again. Paul says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child. Think about it. He talked, he thought, he reasoned like a child. But then he says, but when I became a man, I put those things aside. Are you all with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, helping us and instructing us according to your word. We thank you that Holy Spirit is the teacher. We will open up our hearts to receive all that the Holy Spirit has for us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we, we, we go like, okay, why is he saying that? Um, well, the obvious uh, reason is because when he says, I was a child, you think he's referring to when he was a little kid, but he's not. He's talking about the way he thought under the law. You don't hear me. There, there's people that, that are more law-oriented, and, and we'll get into that a little more, and that means they have not matured in the things of God. They are religious. Now, Paul was, and you heard me say this before, Paul loved God, but he was anti-Christ. He thought that if he can get a, a, a do away with Christ and his followers, that he was doing God a favor. And that was a childish mentality. I want you to know that a lot of times we think that we're free and we're really not. Come on. We think we're mature and then we're really not. But the Bible helps us to understand how you measure maturity. Are you all ready for this? Amen. So uh, to understand why he made the statement, we'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. And I'm going to read from over here. So he, verse 1. Thank you. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sustenes. Verse 2. Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Okay, just, just, let's, hey, give him a hand. Come on. Took him a half hour, but we there. So he says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have what? Love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can phantom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a, f a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Y'all need to hear me. Amen. Because 
what, what everybody considers maturity has to do with that. Like somebody's a tongue talker and they're like, wow, man, that person is something else. This person has faith to get all kinds of stuff and they go like, that's maturity. And Paul says, no, it's not. Because you can have those things, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. Watch it now. If I have, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Next verse. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. You know, once I finish reading this, we'll close in prayer. You can go home. There's nothing else to be said because we, I know we're getting whooped every which way but loose right now. <laughs> Amen. Next verse. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. Next verse. Let's keep it going. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. So now we know why he said, when I was a child. Because when he was a child, or rather when he was under the law, he was one of the most zealous individuals for God. I mean, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had all the accolades, all the titles. He was constantly pushing to, for people to come to God. But remember what I said, he was anti-Christ. And when you're anti-Christ, you're still a child, no matter the degrees, no matter what you do or what have you. Why? Because Christ represented love and grace. You all need to hear me. So he is saying, you know what? Uh, the church has been enamored with all the gifts. The, the church pushes like they determine somebody's spirituality through their giftings and all these different things. Oh, apostle and prophet and all, all this kind of stuff. Oh, that's a great man of faith. But you can be a great man of faith and not have love. And people, after a while, will look at your faith and it will what? It will grow dim. You know why? Because your attitude stinks. No, it's the truth. Can, can I go there? Come on. And so I've been in places where you have these men of churches of, you know, thousands and, you know, their apostles, so and so, and you can't even talk to them. Oh, yeah. You, if you try to talk to them, a usher will come and take you away. Come on. They, they, they're like, you know, they, now, now, are they gifted? Absolutely. Are they apostolic? Absolutely. But because they have no love, all of that means nothing. Come on. And so the church has been caught up in, in titles and so on. You know, they're always like, you know, now, now, I'm not kidding. I'm going to say this. I'm not kidding. They're, they have now titles called cherubim apostle. I ain't lying. It, and I, I'm like, what in the world does that mean? Why? Because people love titles. And the sad thing is that that is happening. And I said it last Sunday because people make it happen. At, at one point, you'll go, I don't care how gifted you are. If you don't have love, you ain't got nothing to say to me. You're going to come to church and you're going to preach this and preach that. People will cry. People will get delivered. And you go home and can't even love your own wife. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what he was saying, you know what? Forget all these things. They're needed. But, but they will be more effective if you're doing it from love as opposed to the law. Because anything can become law, my friend. 
I'm, I'm, I'm up here. I'm, I always tell you, I'm no different than you. You know, people call me apostle. I preach in big churches and so on. I just don't believe my own press. It's the truth. I realize I'm just like you. I'm just, thank you, Lord. I will try to be a good steward of what you placed in my hands, but I'm only human. Come on. And, and, and I need to love and I need to be loved. That's why some people will, will run in, in, in the ministry and lose their family. Because they're more interested in the accolades and the titles and so on and so forth. That's why Paul said, you know what? When I was a child, I thought like a child. I talked like a child. Meaning that he wasn't a kid. But when he missed the love of God and he missed the grace of God, guess what? He was a baby. And I'm afraid that there are tons of believers that are still uh, uh, children. Why? Not because of the amount of time they've been in the Lord or so on and so forth. No, because they still hold on to the law. They still hold on to religion. Amen. Hallelujah. So this whole thing doesn't have as much, as much to do about God's love for us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. My friend, we are loved. God loves you more than you will ever understand. God loves us. God cares for us. Listen, uh, 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 great, no greater love has uh, someone who lays down their life for another. And, and, and so this whole deal is not about... Uh, about us knowing that God loves us, this whole thing is about how much we love God. Y'all need to stay with me. So what he says in, in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 10, he says, but when the completeness comes, what is in part, say in part, disappears. Because when you're a child, you only understand in part. Like I love my, my grandkids and so on, uh, uh, but according to their age, they only know in part. It'll be crazy for me to try to teach them things that are beyond their place of learning. Are y'all here? Why? Because they know in part the word completeness there, or in the King James is the word perfect. And some people, they have said, oh, that's when, what that means when the Bible comes, when the canon was fulfilled. He says, then you don't need this other stuff. I don't know where they get this stuff from. But you ought to be glad that I study the Bible the way I do. Because I will be up here teaching you the same nonsense. No, I'm serious. That does not mean that at all. The, the, word, the word complete there means maturity. Come on. When you mature, you no longer see in part. You no longer uh, 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 um, you know, look like in a shadow. When you mature, you fully understand the love of God in your life and you fully understand how you need to love God if that's the way it works. I don't know what kind of relationship will work otherwise. It can't be one way. Come on. People go like, oh, well, well, God loves me. Hallelujah. At least I know God loves me. No, no, no. You got to love him back. Oh, help me, Jesus. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's awesome to know that God loves us. He loves us in spite of us. He loves us in spite of our faults. Now, religion says he loves me because I deserve it. He loves me because I keep the Bible, I keep the word. No, my friend, that is religion. Because the Bible says that our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. If you are righteous, it's because he declares you righteous. Not because of what we do, but because of what he did on Calvary. Shed his blood, died for us. He did that for a reason. Because we can never love him until we accept his love for us. Amen. Well, how do we know? 
what that word means, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says this. We know this. Ooh, my man is slow today. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be what? Built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become what? Mature, that's that same word, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So the, the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to mature you. But unfortunately, a lot of the fivefold ministry is still teaching law. They are still teaching and making you feel guilty and bringing condemnation upon people. They don't do it on purpose, but they're still seeing in part. They're not seeing clearly. Hello? But the Lord wants us to mature. And the only way that can happen, my friend, is if we learn to love him. And everything we do is because of our love for him. You don't have to convince God to love you. You don't have to do things for him to love you. You don't have to fast for 40 days for him to love you. Somebody say amen to that. <laughs> it's true. You don't have to do that. The Bible says that he died for us while we were just sinners. He loves us because he loves us. But many times we can't experience that love because we don't love back. And if you are in a relationship where love is lopsided, it's terrible. There is no relationship. Come on, somebody. Right? And it's the same with God. Yes, we know. Yes, we know he loves us. He cares for us. How much more does he have to do? To show us that he loves us, but that is not the issue. Amen. So there's different meanings of love, and we're going to see, but one is, uh, uh, is eros, where we get our word erotic. So, yeah, get that dirty mind aside. Because that doesn't mean simply sex and so on. It simply means that it is a selfish love. Come on. It is the kind of love that, that wants self-gratification. Are you all here? And we go like, I would never do that with God. We do it all the time. Because we don't understand. But every time that we're asking God to do something for me, do this, do this, do that, that's for self. But we don't return nothing to him. When God says, if you love me, do this, we ain't worrying about that because we're operating in eros. It's about me. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat nothing. You should know that. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21, Paul says this. <laughs> He says, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And think about it. Everything that we do is about us. Hello? Everything. When we pray is about us. Come on. When we give is about us. When we work is about us. Everything is about us. And we're doing it for our own interest. At some point, my friend, maturity says it's not about me, it's about him. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. It's, it's not about what I can get. It's not about me praying and asking God for 20 things. And then when I'm done, I shut the prayer down. Because I can't even give him love and give him a, a worship and give him. Oh, you're not hearing me. Yeah. It's about us loving him back, and love has a price. And it's all about basically Paul saying, understand the difference between law and grace. It killed Paul. Grace killed him. Are y'all here? 
because he was, uh, like as I said, a Hebrew of Hebrew, Pharisee of Pharisees. He was, man, doing stuff for God that nobody else would do. He was killing Christians because he thought it was a cult. Are you out here? He was zealous. But all that was law because it was about what he did. And think about it. When God called Paul and knocked him off his high horse on the way to Damascus, he was blind. He took his vision away because his vision was wrong. You're not hearing me. His vision was to do things that were not ordained by God. And God said, I'm going to take his vision away. How long? For three days. Three, number three is super important. I'll get into that another time. But he now didn't know what to do, where to go. And God gave him instruction to go to, uh, uh, um, to, go to the street called Straight. In other words, he was going to put his vision straight. And he said, and you're going to go to a man, and he's going to lay hands on you. And his name was Ananias. And his name means grace. Oh, you're not here. Because what he said was, you got the wrong vision. I'm going to take that vision away for three days. On the third day, you're going to be resurrected. Hear me? And the way you're going to be resurrected and be a new man and be a mature man is by, is by going and meeting grace. Yeah. And some of us, my friend, are still blind because God is saying, what are you doing? Every time you think that you deserve my love and my grace in your life, you are, you are blind. That's why when, when, when uh, Jesus always had a teaching moment and uh, he was standing there when this Pharisee had his hands up. And he was worshiping God. Not a bad thing. But then he said this. There was another man there crying, Lord, I am but a sinner. And he said, Lord, I thank you that I am not like that man. Remember that every time God, Jesus gave sight to the blind was significant of bringing what? <laughs> bringing sight to the body or the religious leaders. He didn't just bring sight to the blind just because he thought it was a nice idea or just because he liked the individual. Everything that the Lord did, get this, everything that Jesus did in the Gospels was to illuminate the kingdom. It's why he came. To reestablish the kingdom. We get caught up in, oh, he received this sight. No, my friend. He was trying to help the, the, the disciples understand these folks are blind. And he even said it. He told the Pharisees, you are blind because you say you see. Amen. Look at somebody and say, Relax. Amen. This is all about the law versus grace. The kingdom of God is grace. The law is religion. Well, Lord, I'm going to fast because I need this done. I've been praying. Nothing has happened. So let me try fasting. So what are you saying? What are you saying? You're saying that you are going to work to get what God has already given you for free. Pastor, are you against fasting? No. And don't, so I'm saying it, but now it's recorded. So you can't go and tell somebody, Pastor, I don't believe in fasting. No, go back. I got proof. I believe in fasting, but not like some folks. Because from a religious standpoint, we have taught prayer and fasting through law. 
So if fasting, because they'll say it too, fasting moves the hand of God. Oh, really? So he's not God after all, I am. Because if I can move his hand by works, you're not, you're not hearing me. It's the truth. Religion is so subtle. So subtle, my friend. It's a fine line between religion and grace. But by nature, or by the fallen nature of Adam, we are works-oriented. We are law-oriented. That's why we try to fix everything. Come on. I'm having this issue. I'm going to fix it. I'm having it. Well, well, you haven't been able to fix it for years. What makes you think you're going to do it now? No, because now I'm determined. Oh, I see. You mean now you are more religious. Amen. When, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I talked like a child. Come on, I reason as a child, but now I am a man. And the things that he says, now we see in part, but when you mature, you see clearly. Amen. And that's why people fall into uh, teachings that are more, watch me now, they, those teachings are more law, but we like it because we like the idea that I can do something. And that's why the Lord took the children of Israel from Egypt and put them in the desert. He said, I'm going to put you in a place where you can't do anything. You can't plant crop. You can't do nothing. There is no water. There is no food. Oh, the Lord is mean. He's a mean God. No, no, he's a God of wisdom. He said, I'm going to put you in the place because you need to be detoxed. From the law. You need to be detoxed from your own self-governing. And did they get it? No. They thought God was mean. They thought God took them there to kill them. Am I lying? Why did you bring us out here, Moses, to die? No, to grow you up. Let me go over here. It's the truth. Grow up, mature, cut loose of the law. It's not about you. It's not about what your gifts. It's not about what you can do. And you will never know my love if you get in the way. Come on, somebody. It's the truth. Grace will always cause you to humble yourself. Because grace says, calm down. No, no, no. Calm down. But you don't understand. Calm down. This is not about who you are or what you can do. Pastor, you got to be careful because, you know, people will take that message and do whatever they want. Well, if they do, they need to grow up. Because there's checks and balances, my friend. You could, somebody said, can you do whatever you want? Of course. If you're willing to pay the consequences. That's all. Who you think invented that? The law of sowing and reaping. Come on. He says whatever man sows. That he will also reap. You know why God does that? Because he puts the responsibility back on us. I trust you. I trust you. I give you wisdom. I give you my word. So if you want to go ahead and do some crazy stuff. I ain't going to stop you. But are you willing to pay the price? And it's funny, isn't it? Because sometimes we'll, we do what we want to do and, what, and want God to overlook it. Isn't it true? We're going to hold on, Lord, I'm sorry. Well, you know, God is a gracious God. And so you don't have to worry about him being angry with you. And you don't have to worry about him punishing you. He won't do that. But in many cases, you have to experience the consequence. Because that's the way that then you learn. Aren't y'all happy you came to church today? 
I, 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 I teach. I said it last Sunday. I don't care if it's five people. I'm going to preach the truth. It doesn't matter. I'm not here to, 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 you know, make people happy and all that kind of stuff. That's between you and God. I'm here to teach you the truth. Because only the truth will make you what? Thank you. So what is the purpose of, uh, of grace? Well, first of all, let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 5. It says, the faith and love that springs from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you since the day, here it is, since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Hello? Notice what it's saying. It's saying that the bearing of the fruit and, 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 and all that kind of stuff comes the day you understand grace. Somebody says, there, but you know, there's these people who have hyper grace. You're just saying they have more grace than you. Because there's no, no such thing as hyper grace. Oh, you know, there's people that can take advantage of grace. No such thing. Hello? Now I'm trying to help you to understand grace. But then we go back to, well, then, you know, people are going to think they can do whatever they want. They can. You, you don't need grace to, to know that and to do that. People are doing whatever they want anyway. Grace doesn't make them do that. No, no, it's immaturity. It's them not understanding, and that's okay, because everybody is on different levels. They are, they are some that are immature. Don't beat them. It's like I said before, I can't tell my son Malachi, you got to understand this when he does not have the capacity to understand it. Come on. But then you have some that should know better. Lord have mercy. So what does grace do? Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. So stop there a minute. If grace did not appear, none of us would be saved. You want to do away with grace? You're not saved. Hello? Because of his grace, we are saved. Right? So now watch. Next verse says, it teaches us to say no. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me. And this is the problem with religious people. They are more connected to what they learned before to the revelation of God's grace in his word now. That's why, my friend, I teach and you have the verses. No, no, don't say, oh, yeah, he's against grace. No, no, no. Take down the verses. If you live by the word, you will know the word and the word is going to express his grace in your life. So notice what it says. Grace teaches us to say no, not to say yes to sin. We got it wrong. Where do we get that? Oh, people that are under grace, they're crazy. They do all kinds. You know what it is? Because we have determined what sin is. Yes and amen. The church determined what sin is. When I was growing up, we got saved in 1979, and you had all, mostly all Pentecostal churches at the time. And, the, and, and, and if you had, uh, 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 if you wore pants in church, it was what? Sin. If the women wore pants. Come on. Yeah, I know. It's true. If you, had, if you had your hair done a certain way and you wore makeup, it was a sin. Do you believe that now? No. 
but we did back then. Yeah, because we allowed man to define what sin is. And usually sin is to you what you don't feel free to do. Well, I'm a, we got to understand grace. You heard it. Yeah. Right? So, so sin is what I think sin is. No, you're wrong, my friend. You're wrong. Sin can only be defined by the word of God. And the word sin in the New Testament means to miss the mark. Not your mark. Your mark ain't worth dilly squat. No, I'm serious. But the mark of the cross. You miss the mark, the booze eye. Come on. The arrow, our faith, has to be attached to the tree of the gospel. It has to be attached to the tree in Calvary. It has to say, he died for me when I didn't deserve it. He shed his blood because of his grace. By his grace, I am now saved. Come on. That's all that sin means. Well, now we have expressions of sin. Can I, can I teach today? I feel like teaching. I'm going to do it anyway. That's the truth. So we think that the expressions of sin is sin. Let me put it this way. Disciples get into the boat. Jesus is sleeping. Right? You know the story. The storm comes. And the water is Going into the boat, the Bible says, and they were freaking out. Now, these are professional fishermen. That was their job. That was their business. But it got so bad that they realized, at this point, our giftings mean nothing. See, when you realize that your gifts and your intellect mean nothing, that's when grace kicks in. Come on. So they go like, we're going to die. Somebody goes down, wakes Jesus up. Jesus comes up. He looks at them like, you're tripping. He says, what? What does he say? What did he speak to? The wind. Because the wind was the real problem, not the waves. The waves was an expression of the wind. And we do the same thing. Oh, that's sin. That's sin. This person was watching a movie. That's sin. This person, that's sin. Why? Why would we say that? Remember, those are just expressions of sin. That's an expression of missing the mark. You're here. So now you want to help this person. And you're going to condemn them to death. Because we don't understand what sin is. So we go like, hey, you know what? You keep doing that, you're going to hell. But you're not here. Hey, that's not right. Think about it. Which one of us here is perfect? If you are, raise your hands. We will stone you. No. <laughs> There's nobody perfect. Most people do the things they do because they still have a law, a child mentality. When we learn to love God because of who he is and what he's done, it is the expression of his grace and love in our lives. Now we do things because we love him, not because we have to. Because the minute you feel you have to, my friend, you are under the law. That's why I said, you know, so I'm going to fast to get, well, listen to me very carefully. Very carefully. 
You can fast, and fasting is important. But fasting will make your spirit more sensitive to who God is and what he's already done. So if you're fasting, what's going to happen is that you are first going to lose weight, but that's not the goal. That's true. But secondly, you will sense his presence more. And you will hear what he's saying clearer. And he will remind you that your fasting is a good thing because it causes you to have a better relationship with him. But the fasting does not make him do something. You're not hearing me. Amen. I'm almost done. Say amen. Galatians 5, verse 6. Yeah, that, that, I set you up for that one. Galatians 5, verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. He got it, man. He got it. Paul is saying circumcision law, uncircumcision, grace. Do you, you get it? Because the Jews believe that you cannot serve God and that you cannot have a relationship with, with God unless you were circumcised. That was the law. And Paul says, it's not about being circumcised or uncircumcision. None of it has value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself. The love. See, you can, you, can, you can argue with me all you want, but you can't argue with that. Because circumcision was man's attempt to be right with God. And that's why when the Jew, when he reached a certain age, he had to be circumcised. Because if he wasn't, then God didn't love him. And he had no relationship with God. That's the law. And you go, well, we don't do that today. Well, yes, we do, but that's another story. But you have to understand that circumcision is man's attempt to be right with God by doing something. And he says it's not about that. But it, it, because the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So instead of me judging somebody, I love them. Hello. There's people that I don't agree with, but I love them. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not God. Judge not so that you won't be judged. And we do that a lot. We judge people. We do, well, I'm better than them. What are you trying to say, man? If you say that, grow up. Mature. You're no longer a child. You're a child of the kingdom. A child of grace. Amen. Okay. Next verse says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Now listen to me very carefully. That's why we have to be careful what we hear. You can be on TV and hear a preacher and you're like, oh my God, that's awesome. And he can be injecting law and religion and you don't even know it. Because your emotions and so on are getting, you know, pumped up. And, you know, and, and th so he's saying, wait a minute. The expression here is an Olympic expression. It is about somebody running a race and somebody else coming right in front of them and taking them off course. So he's saying, you were running good. Who did this to you? And I guarantee you that most of us that have learned grace and so on is only a matter of time before you get off course. That's why we have to have teaching like this. Because teaching like this will cause you to get back on the right course. Hello? Watch. Next verse. That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. It's not God. It's somebody teaching you religion again. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Next verse. 
I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that might be, will have to pay the consequences. Mm -hmm. Next verse. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Okay. La 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 la. It's probably not. Yeah. Okay. I have such an example that you should do as I have done for you. Next verse. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Come on, somebody. Right? So he's saying, look, we, we to follow the Lord. Grace, my friend, is not a thing. It is a person. Jesus is grace personified. Are y'all here? Yeah. So it's not like, a, I mean, let me teach you about grace like it's a, a separate thing. No, when you teach about grace, you're teaching Christ. Come on. It's the truth. Are you all still with me? Okay. Now, I think we've run off course here. Okay. Look. Man, 13. Oh, I made a mistake. Anyway, I'm going to say it while you find the verse. Jesus now is resurrected. Amen. And he appears to the disciples. And then he breaks bread with them. And he is starting to teach them. And he talks to Peter. Remember, Peter was the one that did what? Three times. And he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Wow. Peter says... Of course I love you. He says, then feed my sheep. Second time, Peter, do you love me? You know I do. No, the first time is feed my lamb. Second time is feed my sheep. Are y'all here? Third time, Peter... Do you love me? And Peter gets frustrated. Are you all here? I would too. I already told you. How many times do I have to? First of all, he told, he asked him that question three times, and he had already what? Denied him three times. There's a purpose in why he's asking him. Because one of the, besides a person teaching you wrong, like we talked about, the second reason why we cannot receive or rather love God is because of something that we've done. Hello? I'm almost done. Stay with me. So he says the third time, do you love me? The issue here is this, that every time Jesus said, Peter... Do you love me? He used the Greek word agapeo, agape, which means to love supremely. And Peter would respond, you know I love you, but the Greek word is phileo, brotherly love. So Jesus is trying to get him to love like he loves. But Peter says, no, I'm going to love you like a brother. You're not hearing me. Phileo is where we get the word Philadelphia from. That's why Philadelphia is known as the city of brotherly love. Are you all still here? Second time, Jesus says, but Peter... Do you agape me? Well, Lord, you know I phileo you. 
Oh, you're not hearing me. And so he's going to give him the third opportunity to get healed. Because the reason he chose Peter to say that too is because Peter had denied him and Peter was going through internal issues. Peter was going through condemnation. Peter didn't feel worthy to love God. And that's why he would respond, I phileo, like a brother. Do you agape me? I phileo you. Y'all hear? And the reason some people cannot love God is because of what we've been through. A lot of times we measure the fact I can love God if I'm doing everything right. And he says, "Uh uh-uh, you're missing. When you were a child, you thought like a child. But now you are a man. A person of grace is a man. A person of grace is a woman. And, And Jesus was trying to tell him, my friend, you can love me this way because I have forgiven you. And I love you. And I don't hold this against you. So I'm going to give you a third shot. Peter! Do you agape me? And he couldn't do it. That's why it's easier for some of us to let God love love us. But it's difficult for us to love him, and we don't know why. Because whenever you're going to love God in that way, something happens. All your faults start coming back. And you start reminding yourself about how many times you failed Jesus. If you ain't ain't hearing me. And then it becomes, well, I love you, but like a brother. And we don't even know what's happening. And Jesus was going to the heart of the matter. Jesus wasn't trying to be a jerk by keep telling him that. Jesus was trying to heal him. He was trying because he knew what happened when he denied him three times. He wanted to commit suicide. He was done. It was the worst thing in, in his life because he had just finished saying, I'll die for you. And Jesus said, no, you won't. You will deny me not just once, but three times. And it killed him. And I want you to know, my friend, that the only way you can be healed of your past, the only way you can be healed of your past failures is to embrace grace. Because in spite of it, he still loves us. And in spite of it, he says, you can love me with the agape love. You can love me the way I love you if you let all that go and stop being religious unto yourself because watch it a religious person hurts themselves first before anybody amen yeah because the same thing that they couldn't judge somebody for or hold against somebody is because they do it to themselves A religious person will condemn themselves like nobody's business. If they do something wrong, they are tore up. And that's why behind that childish mentality, they can judge others. And they will judge others when they are doing okay. My, my, my. I done opened up a can I was going to say worms, but I think a can of whoop ass is what <laughs> And yeah, and I, I just said that for the religious folks, right? They're going to go like, oh my God, how can pass? Ooh, the Lord is going to, please. Please. It's the truth. It's word. If it wasn't for the grace of God, you would not even be saved. Come on. So forget everything else. You do away with grace 
And remember that salvation is not a one-time thing. Here goes another one. Because the Bible says, work out your own salvation. It is a process. Come on. So at some point, you can stop the process of salvation because you'd rather do law than keep grace. Oh, Lord have mercy. So I want us to have the opportunity. Is this about God loving us? Absolutely not. If you make it of that, then you will always try to please God, and you can't. Because the Bible says the only way you can please God is by what? Faith. Right? But we have to have the opportunity to let Holy Spirit help us. And if you can look at yourself and instead of saying Peter, say your name. And say, I agape love God. Hello? Why? The Bible's clear. We love, we agape, because he first agape us. And if it wasn't that he first loved us, there's no way you can love him this way. Because the only reason we can love him this way is because we accepted his love. Now watch. And when you accept that love by faith and grace, then that is the same love you're going to give back to him. Amen? And some of us need to be healed. We've carried junk for so long. And every time we try to progress, junk comes up and we fail. Then we condemn ourselves. Then we don't, we don't feel worthy, just like Peter did. And that is in there for us. What he is saying is, look, man, you've been hurt. You've gone through, through stuff. You have failed many times. But you can still love God. The way he loves you. You can boldly say. In the midst of your junk. God I love you. And you know why in many cases we don't do it? Because we feel like hypocrites. I'm not going to say I love God. Because I just messed up. I just did this. No my friend. Get it right. If you're saying that. You're submitting yourself to the law. And you're still being a child. God, you heard it, right? All the things in 1 Corinthians 13. That's God's love. When you read it, you go, oh my God, oh my God. What? I don't know if I can do that. You can't. Because that's referring to God's love. And if you love him the way he loves you, then his love starts flowing through you. And then you start doing the same thing that he said, you won't be chasing titles. You won't be chasing money. You won't be chasing any of those things. What you want to do is to love. Love is the greatest thing. Now, faith, hope, love. The greatest of these is love. Don't you stand We're going to pray. Peter, do you agape me? We should be able to respond with boldness. Lord, I agape you. Yeah, I haven't been perfect. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. But yet... I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Raise your hands all over this place. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. You said it. Whomever the Son sets free is free indeed. And you have set us free, first and foremost, from ourselves. Today we can boldly say, when I was a child, I talked like a child. But when I became a man, I put those things away. Right now, we're putting religion away. Right now, Father, we put away all those things that have hindered us in our relationship with you. And we, Father, not only receive your love, but we love you back. Lord, we declare in the name of Jesus that we agape you. We love you. We honor you. And we thank you for setting us free. That love will be the motivating factor in whatever we do. That love, Father, will rule and reign in our hearts and minds. That we would not judge people, but we will love people. We'll leave their relationship with you up to you. But you've called us to love one another and to love you above all things. So, Father, I thank you. Holy Spirit, now help us. Bring back to remembrance everything we've learned. Bring back into remembrance, Lord, that you love us and we love you. We're free today. We're free. And we thank you for it. Now listen to me carefully, church. Just like everything else, this is a process. Just like everything else, you have to work at this. Love will always cause you to forgive. Love will always cause you to give. Love will always cause you to not hold grudges and do all this kind of stuff. Are you listening to me? But the only time that that love can be released is when you say out of your own mouth, I love you, Lord. I agape you. And when you say that, then you'll find that if you can love a God who you can't see, you'll love the person that you can't see. And you will love your kids, and you will love your spouse, and you will love your co-worker, and you will even love your enemy because we're free to do that. Thank you, Father. Thank you for doing a work in us. And during praise and worship, I just sensed it. God is going to do something today. It was happening during praise and worship. Are y'all here? Don't leave this place without saying to him, Lord, I agape you. And it's funny because before Jesus asked Peter, did he love him? He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? We always have things, my friend, that we love more. Whatever your focus and whatever you value is the thing you love. That's why if you value money, then that's what you love. You're not hearing me. Come on. And that's why he said, do you love me more than these things and we have to make up our mind to love him because everything my friend that we have is because of his love for us and everything that you will have is because of his love for us and our love for him amen so now it's kind of hard. I think I'm going to start receiving the offering right after praise and worship because it's kind of hard after I preach. And, then, and now, take your seat for a moment. And because our motivation is love, then I'm going to tell you and ask you to receive or to give today by love. Let me give you an example of how religion gets in everything. Have you ever heard a preacher talk about giving? 
How does that scripture go? The devourer. Remember that? If you don't give, the devourer will come. And to, do you realize, my friend, that it's religious? But it's in the Bible, yes, it's in the Old Testament. And one of the things that we have to learn is the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. Let me put it another way. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. You can't have old and new together. You can learn from the old, but we live by the new. Are y'all here? So now that's a source of what? Manipulation. It's called law. If you, if you don't give today, the devil is going to rob you. Please. You, you won't hear that in this church. You won't hear. If you don't give, you just go on your merry way. The reason we give is because we love him. The reason we give is because the Bible says we should. Not because God needs anything, but because it is the way that he gives things to us. Give and it shall be given back to you. He's not saying give and that's it. He says, I have to find a way to bless you. And that way is what? Sowing and reaping. When you give today, give by love. Because you love God. I'd rather you say, I'm giving because I love God. I'm not too fond of the church. Who cares? You're going to give to the Lord. Amen? Because you love Him. So, you know how this works. If you're giving by uh, online, it's up there on the screen. If you're giving cash or you're writing out a check for $5,000, see these guys. <laughs> see, see, and y'all you know, you know, don't get it. If I was where you are, I would go like this. The minute I said 5,000, I'll go like this. Why? Because what I'm saying is I'm believing God for that. We don't, we don't get it yet. Yeah. It's not you're committing to 5,000. You're saying I'm believing God. I'm going to respond to that. Amen. So if you're giving $5,000, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Amen. The ushers handed out the envelopes, and when you're ready, you can come up here and dunk them in the buckets. But let me say to you that I love you, and my motive, motive has always been love. And because of that, I want to feed the sheep. I want to feed the lambs. The word lambs there means the young believers. And I won't shortchange you. And I'm not going to lie to you just to impress you. I'm not going to teach something just so that you'll go, hey, and jump up and down. No, I'm going to teach you the truth, whether it hurts or not. Because I love you. And I care for you. Why don't you stand? If, when you're ready, you can come up here, and then we're going to close in prayer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. I pray, Lord, that all of us would leave with your grace and your love and your mercy. Father, that it would transform us. That we would be able to say, I love you, even when we don't feel like it. But we know that we're loving people by the love, the agape love of God himself. I thank you, Lord, that from this point on, we will stay mature and not go back to religion, not go back to the law. We are free, and we thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen, amen, amen and amen. God bless you. Love you guys. And um, we will be giving you more information on Thursday night service. Every time I pick a day, something is happening. They got, they got the children's stuff going on, so we're going to have to move that, but we'll let you know. Amen. 